just about one minute. But as folks are coming in, if you could and put your name and where you're joining us from in the chat, that would be great. We'll be back with you in about a minute. Nia, I had shared while you were off the screen that um, I have some slides, but I'm not going to show any because this is conversational. I just wanted to make sure that was cool. Unless you wanted me to show something, just say something, okay? Yep, no, that's cool. We can send them out by follow-up if that makes sense. Perfect. So we had over 300 folks register for this conversation today. So we're just gonna give it a couple more minutes for folks to join us, um, but keep those introductions coming. Thanks so much for letting us know where you're joining us from. All right, I'm sure folks will continue to join us as we go, but we are going to jump in because we have a lot of great conversation to have today. Welcome everybody. My name is Nia West Bay. I am a senior policy analyst on the youth team at the Center for Law and Social Policy or CLASP. Um, for folks who may not know, CLASP is an anti-poverty advocacy organization. We're located in Washington, DC, and we work across a number of areas that impact the lives of people with low incomes or living in poverty in this country. Um, and the youth team is focused across a range of issues that impact the lives of young people between the age, primarily between the ages of 16 and 25 or so, um, who are out of school, out of work, uh, with a racial equity and gender equity lens. So we also do some work that focuses on the intersections of race and gender and how they impact young people's lives and policies. Um, so we have in the last several months, as all of you have been living all of the things that have been happening in the world in this time, um, and have really been thinking about how we could be more transformational in our approach to policy and how we can go deeper on some issues that we've maybe been working on for a while, but where there's really a need for some deeper level change. Um, and so that has pushed us into what we've been calling healing center liberation policy, which is a body of work where we've really done a series of online engagements focused around several issues. The first one was on protest movement building and mental health. We had a couple focused on reimagining the justice system. We had one where we learned about healing justice. And now this is the second of a two part series where we've been looking at education, justice and police free schools. Um, and so we had, we were together two weeks ago with a group of folks where we talked about the history of the police free schools movement, both from the local perspective of folks in Oakland and Chicago, as well as from a national partner and really heard a lot of themes about um, sort of the, how that movement is longstanding and the victories that the movement is achieving all around the country and really wanted to bring folks together today to think about what does it actually look like to have safe schools, right? Because we don't wanna just talk about what we don't want and what we wanna remove. We then wanna talk about how we wanna invest and what we wanna replace it with and really make it real and tangible for folks. Because I think it can be hard if you've never seen a school system operating 
um, without a heavy law enforcement presence or without some of the criminalization and policing practices that have become so common, um, it's hard for folks to really paint a picture of what does it look like when you take those things away. So I have several folks who are here with me today who are gonna help us do that and I'll come back to them in just a minute. Um, so first, a couple of logistics. Many of you are already doing this, but we want everybody to please put your name and where you're joining us from in the chat. We ask that folks in our audience keep yourself on mute. However, we do want this to be a very conversational kind of dialogue. Um, so we'd love to have folks participate as we go and just sort of ask questions as you have them. And then we'll do our best to work them in the conversation as we go instead of just waiting till the end. So please, if you have questions, do drop them in the chat and we will try our best to work as many of them as we can into the conversation. And we'd also love for you to engage with us on social media using the hashtag invest to heal. Um, and this event is streaming live on um, Facebook Live on CLASP's Facebook page. So you can also check that out and share that link with folks as we go. Um, so a couple of other things I wanna share in terms of key context. Um, in addition to what we learned about at the last webinar in terms of sort of the, some of the local victories in Oakland and Chicago and different places around the country, um, at the national level, we've recently had the introduction of the Counseling Not Criminalization Act in um, the House and the Senate, which is really, uh, I said as we were looking at the bill, this is my favorite bill that I've ever read. Uh, because what that bill is intended to do is to encourage um, and sort of incentivize school systems to end contracts with police departments and invest those funds in mental health services for students. But that legislation is really building off of the work that has been done locally all around the country um, with the guidance and support uh, and investment of many partners all around the country to really who, who already know what are the needs in terms of resources to really make schools safe environments for young people and all the ways in which um, police and law enforcement presence in schools are harmful. So we're gonna get into all of that right now. Like I said, we have um, some phenomenal panelists on hand, which I'm just going to introduce them briefly. We're gonna include their bios and some information about the organizations that they represent in the chat. And then they're gonna share a little bit more about who they are and what they do as we go. Um, so let's get to it. I'm joined by Miaya Coleman, who is from Voices in Chicago, Illinois. We have Jasmine De La Paz, who's joining us from the West Coast. Stockton, California. And we have Dr. Art McCoy, who is joining us from uh, Jennings, Missouri. And they will all share a bit with us in a minute, but let's take a quick minute to, uh, with your reactions, if you want, or just a little wave to welcome all of our panelists. And we are going to jump right in. Um, so I am, you know, I said your names, but that was about it. So I'm going to kick us off by asking each of you to share your name, your organizational affiliation, sort of what is the work that you do? And um, because we all need it right now, what brings you joy and inspiration in the work that you do? And Miaya, I'm going to ask you to kick us off. Hello, everyone. My name is Miaya Coleman, um, gender identity pronouns, she, her, hers. Uh, and I am with Voice, which is Voices of Youth in Chicago's Education. Uh, so Voice is basically um, a, a youth-led group working, up, made up of young people of color, working to end the school to prison pipeline uh, using statewide legislation. Um, and my role basically is um, I'm a Voice alumni. Uh, so what I do is I train young people to basically talk to legislators um, when we're in Springfield and um, work on local issues within their communities and in their school systems and just basically kind of give them that little push that they need to um, make sure that they're educating their legislators on the importance uh, of making sure that they get resources inside of their schools and communities. Um, and I would say something that brings me joy um, and admiration in my work would be the young people. Um, I love watching them grow and develop and just watching them uh, change and blossom. Um, I remember being a young person 
just working to, you know, get resources in, in my school. Um, and it was it was hard, you know, because I, I'm a young person from the North Lawndale neighborhood in Chicago, which is on the west side, and, and just, you know, not really thinking that anyone was going to listen to me because I'm an African American girl coming off the west side, and, and they probably don't think I know what I'm talking about most of the time. So I remember being that young person in their shoes and, and just, you know, so seeing change happen within my school system, uh, it gave me that push to want to work with these young people and show them that change can really happen. Um, and just watching them grow um, and develop, they came from, you know, quiet young people to now they're, you know, wanting to do the work and wanting to educate legislators and they're uh, running after legislators when it's time to lobby and they're just like, hey, hey, excuse me, Mr. Representative. And it, it's just amazing to watch them grow. So I would say that brings me joy within my work, just watching the young people be amazing. Awesome. Thank you, Miaya. Um, Jasmine, same question to you. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jasmine Delafoss. I'm based here in Stockton. I go by she, hers. And before I introduce myself, I just wanted to say thank you to Nia, thank you to Whitney and Dewey, Keisha and the entire class team uh, for your tireless effort and work and bringing us together. It's just uh, really powerful to be here with each and every one of you. Um, I mentioned I'm from Stockton, California, um, and I work with the Gathering for Justice as a senior regional organizer um, and works really at the intersections of racial justice, juvenile justice, violence prevention, and educational equity work. Um, our founder, uh, Mr. Harry Belafonte, and, and leader, uh, executive director, um, Carmen Perez, uh, has been deeply pushing us around how the intersections of the school to prison pipeline sort of impact education and our young people directly. Um, and it's through my personal experience of touching the juvenile justice system and being impacted directly by public schools in Stockton that really led me to uh, later on in my uh, organizing years realizing that geez I was one of the students who was directly impacted by the school to prison pipeline. Um, through that, I became one of the co-founders with our mayor, Mayor Tubbs, for the Reinvent South Stockton Coalition, um, and also started and co-founded the Stockton Schools Initiative, which was an education policy um, initiative that organized parents and students across the city, specifically young black and brown students directly impacted, um, to advocate and learn how policies directly impacted their daily lives. Um, and was providing tools and tactics and skills on how we can show up and really change and dismantle the way the system worked through a very abolitionist mind um, or, or framework. Um, um, and so that is sort of how we began to organize and currently through our work with the Gathering for Justice, um, we've been working to uh, really uh, change the way schools and folk uh, and, and leaders are really looking at safety in schools um, and really pushing to have police free schools here in Stockton um, and you know look forward to sharing a little bit more about what that looks like for us but just really honored to be on this call with everyone and and really learn from each and every one of you on this call so thank you again Nia. Thanks Jasmine and don't forget to tell us what brings you hope and inspiration. What brings me hope joy you know is is you all, you know, it's like being on calls, you know, we just come off of a week with elections and we know that elections just weren't impacting, you know, the presidential races, but actually our local races, you know, here in Stockton, we had two very important seats that were up. And to this day, we don't even know the results yet of where we stand, you know, it's very tight. We have a lot of people who, who've come out to really push against our agenda. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of critical important things happening. And so, conversations like this and and organizers and leaders who continue to show up every day to do the work to to, to fight back um, is really what brings me joy and to know that everyone is still doing this work um, and that it's really our responsibility so uh, that's what's bringing me joy at this moment right now thanks jasmine and um, dr mccoy let's kick it to you same question who are you and what do you do 
Who am I? Well, in a soundbite, uh, I'm the founder and, and president of SAGES, which stands for Severing Attainment Gaps That Exist in Society. That means that if we don't have something, we're going to cut that out right away and sever it. We're going to get what we need. And so that's what I'm always really inspired about, meeting the need at the speed of the need uh, for what we need. So that's an organization where I've raised over $15 million to help make things happen that wouldn't have otherwise happened with private money. You can help do things that public systems often don't do. I'm also the CEO and superintendent of Jennings School District, which is located in St. Louis, Missouri. I, I educate the tip of St. Louis City. I educate about a fourth of Ferguson, Missouri, where, which is known because of Michael Brown and Liz McSpadden. Uh, and God bless his soul, he was one of my students in ninth grade when I was the first black superintendent of the Ferguson Florissant School District. Uh, and so ultimately then it represents all of Jennings. Uh, and so what do I do as the CEO, as the chief who makes sure that I'm like the one who guards my, my people, uh, I'm the chief guardian, I'm the champion for children. And so we've made sure that we had no arrest uh, within our system because we empowered our students and our people. We've had 100% graduation rates with 98% African-American population of students in our district and 100% of them actually receiving free meals, 96% on uh, free reduced lunch, but 100% graduation rates for the past four years. We don't let our zip code define us. We don't let our ethnicity, race, gender, sexual preference, any of that, that doesn't define us. We are seeing for more than the outer us. We are seeing for the us that's inside of us, placed inside of us. So uh, what inspires me most is when people doubted us and thought that we couldn't go to Harvard, thought that we couldn't uh, actually have three therapists per school versus cops. Uh, we've done it and we continue to do it and the results are 100% graduation rates, 100% career college placement rates and graduation. So it's a pleasure to be with you and I'm looking forward to this discussion. Some other connections are Jobs for America's graduates. I'm on the state board to help sure, make sure that all of our graduates across the country get jobs. Uh, you know, when 20 million people are out of jobs during a COVID reality, uh, people need guardians and champions to make sure that you have employment, gainful employment, and that's especially our youth. And I'll end lastly with, I'm most proud that I'm the only superintendent in St. Louis County or city that actually opened our schools in July and on time during COVID-19. Why does that make me proud? Because some people need you. And so we said, we trust you to be smart enough to not show up when it's not safe. So don't show up. But if you need us, these people are going to be here for you. <laughs> so, so we had 2,000 people show up because some people really needed people uh, for mental health reasons. I'm a champion for mental health. I'm on the BJC board uh, and so forth. So anxiety, depression, those things are real. Suicide rates are high. Abuse rates are high. And so we've been here for our families, our communities, and it's a pleasure to be here with you right now. Thank you all so much. And again, to everybody listening, like I said, they're phenomenal. So if you all have questions for these phenomenal people, go ahead and drop them in the chat. I'll ask my questions until I see some from y'all. Um, so Dr. McCoy, I'm gonna come right back to you with the next question um, because part of visioning, right, is you gotta be able to know what we're going for. And I think sometimes in these conversations, sort of what is the role of school? What is the role of education in our communities and in our society gets lost? From your perspective, what do you see as the purpose of school and of education? And what is it that we're really trying to achieve here? Great question. So, so many people get it wrong, and particularly the people that call themselves educators, uh, superintendents and administrators don't know the answer well enough. The purpose of education is threefold, an educated electorate for citizenship. I'm gonna give it to you in three C's, citizenship. So that when you have a situation like this with a Donald Trump versus a Biden, you're educated well enough commonly to know who to say, heck no, you don't represent me. So I'm gonna make my, my, my no vote into a vote for no against you. That's educated, an educated electorate for citizenship. So that's number one, to make sure that you're teaching real things for representation. Uh, empowering, enlightening, and engaging people about themselves. Secondly, the second C is character development. This came from as early as 1649 uh, or 47 called the Deluder Satan Act when Puritans was there saying, we're going to dilute Satan out of you, beat the hell out of you, that kind of stuff with the whooping and the cat. All that stuff was real in schools. Well, it was really about character development. You don't have an education until you know who you are, and that's character development. If you know who you are and you know your pronouns or not, you know, him, 
or, or him, he, and so forth for a male, then you say who you are, come to know who you are. If you are someone of another gender, someone of another ethnicity, someone that may have been oppressed, know who you are and then fight past that oppression so that you can represent who you are and others who are like you. The last C is careers. Education is a means to an end for career a living wage so that you can make your family and yourself happy, happy, healthy, and well for the life and the liberty and the pursuit of happiness. So those are the three purposes, citizenship, character development, and careers. Thanks, Dr. McCoy. Jasmine, what would you add to that in terms of the purpose of schools and education? I would just say, I think like uh, for me, like one of my mentors always one of my mentors always often says is that the greatest investment we can make um, in, in our people is, is an investment in our people. And I think that when we do that, that is one of the greatest and most important things about education is a true investment about giving young people the opportunity and access. Um, and I'm not talking about equality and, and even I'm even talking about beyond equity, right? We're talking about education being the, the, the field and platform for every young person to have the, the access and opportunity um, and, and exact resources that they need. Um, you know, oftentimes people see sort of that image around equality, equity, justice. You know, there's one that says justice, one that says liberation, and then one that says reality. And the reality is, is that we want to get to a place where young people actually can achieve justice, can achieve uh, uh, the, the, the liberation, meaning that all young people should have the opportunity to, to, to be able to become critical thinkers themselves, to be able to, to have the resources and tools that they need. Um, and I, you know, oftentimes um, reflect on just sort of, uh, you know, one of the important things that sort of education can do and do better in is really about creating this the creating a place where education and schools sort of become about caring for your neighbor about caring for one another and also about loving our culture loving our identities and who we come from and when you can be able to build sort of the care and culture of a young person i think that that is a big part that schools can play um, in every single individual person's life um, and to me, I think that that's one of the most critical things about education um, and really what its purpose is um, and why, um, why it's fundamental for us to continue to invest in it um, and make sure that we're leveling the playing field for, for, for young people, specifically Black, Indigenous, and Brown young people. Jasmine, we're going to come back to all of that in one minute. I want to hear from Miaya on... Um, the role of education in schools, because you brought a little history to it when we were talking about this earlier. So I would love to hear that from you. Um, so um, I feel like the purpose of education, so um, like I was telling um, Nia earlier, um, our ancestors fought to get an education. They fought to be able to have the right to go to school um, and they, they fought to be able to read and things like that. Um, and something that I was taught is people can take anything away from you, but something that they can't take is your knowledge um, because your uh, mind and knowledge and having knowledge is a powerful thing. Um, and my grandmother used to always tell me how she would basically uh, have to teach her older siblings how to read because she was the only one that could be able to go to school. Um, um, they actually picked out of the household um, who would go to school and she was the youngest, so she got to go. Um, and just listening to my grandmother tell me how she had to teach her older siblings who were older than her and who, you know, could have went to school, but they had to work, you know, they had to provide for the family. Um, my great, great grandmother actually had um passed away and then my grandfather was poisoned by um, a white man because he was the only black man that owned a grocery store. So by, you know, her older siblings having to raise her and the other younger siblings, she was the only one that could, you know, teach folks how to read and things like that. So I think that when your ancestors have fought many years to 
get an education, I think that is important that we understand that knowledge is something that, you know, no one in this world can take from you. Um, I think that's what education is, just basically having the knowledge to be successful, because like I said before, they can take whatever they can from you. But when it comes to knowledge, when this is this is something that's very powerful and no one can take that from you. Um, and I think that, you know, when you use your mind, it's very powerful as a, as a you know, a young person, as a, a colored person, um, just, you know, I think that's what's very important in our education system. When we have the right to actually go to school and get an education and not feel like we're going to school and, and being set up for prison um, and, and our young people being put into detention rooms and things like that are sent to uh, a, a room where they're questioned and things like that. I think that our young people deserve the right to have an education. Their ancestors have fought many years to get. So I think that that's, you know, the importance and the purpose of an education. And Mia, I'm going to stay with you because we have a question from the crowd for you. Um, a little bit more about your journey as an activist, sort of what brought you into activism, and then what are some of the achievements, activities, things that you've done as an activist? Ooh, that's a lot. Um, so uh, I started this work when I was about eight years old. Um, I have a family full of activists. Um, they have done activism uh, for many years. Um, and when I first started, um, it was just basically working on gun violence because um, my grandmother had actually um, been a victim of gun violence. Uh, she was shot in the head for, from someone asking her for a cigarette. Um, and basically the bullet was still in her head and things like that. So um, that caused her to do the activism and, and basically bring me and my siblings in and, and my mom and uh, my aunt and uncle. So we all started to basically um, just fight to get the gun violence out of my community um, because where I come from, I'm, uh, like I said before, I'm in Chicago on the west side um, in the North Lawndale neighborhood where violence is literally a big issue in my neighborhood um, and gun violence at that. Um, and then my cousin was actually shot in a gas station near my neighborhood um, and not having the resources that I needed, such as a counselor, um, it really caused me to not be able to be successful in school to where my grades would drop. Uh, my, my mom was trying to find out what was wrong, but she couldn't really do anything because she's not a counselor. She's not trained in those type of things. Um, and then she would try to get me into different programs but these programs weren't programs where people were trained to handle these type of traumatic issues. Um, and so basically, I, I, I started to get into this work when I was in high school um, because I knew that there were there were other kids who were, you know, other teens and, and young people who were like me who suffered uh, from gun violence in the communities and in their families and, and things like that. Um, and so I wanted to do something more. I wanted to show other young people, hey, you don't have to think about retaliation. You can think about a, a program that you can go to and invest in and actually heal through justice. Um, and so I got involved in voice where we were talking about um, getting resources um, back into our schools. And I was like, whoa, that's something that I want to work on. Um, and, and basically, I had seen the over policing inside of my school and there was not enough counselors. There's literally like 350 kids to one counselor. And it's like she's focused on the seniors because they're graduating and, and stuff. And no one's, you know, trained inside of my school to handle traumatic situations that young people face with whether it's in their homes, in their communities. Um, and I was just like, man, I want to do something about that. Um, and so I got involved um, in voice. And then as I was involved in voice, um, one of my classmates was actually gone down on Halloween um, of 2017, no, 2016. Um, he was gunned down on Halloween. And the next day we had to go to school. And I was like, whoa, like, this is a, this is a big issue. Like, my classmate is no longer going to be sitting on the side of me anymore or in the back of me in different classes. And I remember the hallways being quiet that year. And I remember just there was nothing but, you know, tears in everyone's eyes. And, you know, the students were just like angry 
um, and there was like no one to actually talk to us about it. Um, so my um, principal had actually got a priest program person. And that was the first time I actually seen them actually invest in our young people. And it made me want to go harder in this work because I feel like there's other young people like me who face these situations and who aren't, you know, able to talk to anyone. And there's young people in my community who are going through the same things. And I felt like it was really important for me to do something, even if no one else in my community stepped up, I needed to be that voice, I needed to be that person. Um, and so when when me and voice had started um, working together, uh, I was, you know, just a young person trying to get resources. And then I started to develop as a young person when I started to see these different changes. Um, I started to see um, SB 100 that we had worked on where um, students weren't able to get suspended for more than three days. Uh, that got passed and, you know, that's still in the works and everything. Um, and then basically trying to get these cops out of our schools. When I started this in 2016, they were just like, oh, Oh, no, I'm literally the only young person at this negotiations table with these big, huge people. And I'm just like, oh, my God, I'm so scared. But it taught me a whole lot. It taught me how to, you know, actually stand up for myself in the right way and use words in the right way. There was times that, you know, these people would use words that I didn't understand. And I would go back home and I'm just like, I'm going to learn that word. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make sure that when I go back to that table and they ask me a question, I know everything that they ask me and I can use those same words. So I would go home and get in a dictionary. And I'm just like, what is, um, what, what is this? what is this? Um, and so, you know, I, I would sit in those negotiations meetings and, and basically think that we had no hope. But when I started to see these changes happening, people started agreeing that, you know, well, yeah, there are, cops aren't educated to handle these type of traumatic issues. Let's, you know, bring counselors in. And after fighting for so long, I have actually seen a change. Um, two of our schools that we work with in our geographical areas, um, they are now police free and we are working with CPS to actually um, maintain police free schools and we're working with our other geographical areas to make sure that the um, local school council members know why we are trying to get police out of schools, which is solely for the young people and solely for getting mental health services that young people need because we need to start getting to root causes of problems um, in, in our school systems and in our communities and, and at our homes. So that is really, you know, the rundown of why I started this work and why I still do this work because I've seen so much change, um, whether it's me doing my housing work and or me doing the police free schools work or me doing um, open bottles, broken policies. Like I've, I've seen so much change throughout the, the time of me working from just being an eight year old kid to now being a 22 year old woman. Um, and I continue to do this work not only for myself but for my grandmother for the other young people who are you know going through the things that I have went through and, and still going through and even though I still face depression and anxiety I still do this work because I think that it is very important for me to continue this and continue showing young people that you can really really heal through justice yes me I uh Feel it through justice. That that was a hashtag in there. All right, I was gonna go one way, but I'm watching the chat on the side, and I'm like, we gotta go another way. Dr. McCoy, I gotta bring you in next, um, which is related to the next question about, um, which is gonna be generally about what safety in schools looks like. But there's been a lot of conversation in the chat around teachers and the adults in the building, and this is something that we talked about a little bit during prep, and you had a little might be might get another hashtag out of it but can you talk a little bit about um the work that you've done with adults in your sure. system to sort of um prepare sure. them to prepare the environment to be safe for young people and what that looks like definitely it's so important um so our teachers are life coaches of course they're certified to teach math english and science but they teach students and so they put students first so that means that we look at maslow's hierarchy of needs before Bloom's taxonomy of learning. What does that mean? We look at their belonging and love. We look at their safety in their home and in their community. We look at their physiological needs. We look at the wraparound supports. We look at self-esteem. We look at who are you first. And with the teachers stopping their one, two, three and learning, teaching kids how to count to switching to them to teaching what counts. You count, you matter. 
That is all I want. If a teacher wants to only teach one, two, three, we don't need you because I can get an AI to do that. I can get a monkey to do that. I can get a parrot to do that. But if a teacher can teach kids what counts and see on Zoom, I heard three gunshots. I heard, I saw four kids running through. I see you in your pajamas and you're an English teacher, but you're saying, I see your pajamas. Tell me when you got up. I see you. I support you. You are sufficient. That is the only teacher we hire. We don't hire, we don't, we don't need a scientist that, that only is worried about science. We need a scientist that says, yeah, in your community, you die four times more. This is why science is important to you. See, because if the teacher can't see their content through the lens of their pupil, then they're not doing very much for them as they're in those formative years and with trauma. I had a very student say some of the same things that was just said, and I seared it on my heart because this is the type of teacher I can, I am, and I have to make myself be daily and help my others to be. She came to me, a, a, a girl at 14 and said, who can I turn to? I'm a person lost in the world. I don't know where to turn. I'm a girl wanting to achieve at anything I do. I want to be treated like I exist. I want to be seen for more than the outer me. I want to be seen for the person placed inside of me, but I feel like I'm all alone in the world. I feel like there's no one or nowhere to turn to when I feel like it's the end of me, wanting to commit suicide. Sometimes I want to run away to a place where no one could hurt me. Sometimes life for me will never go right. As much as I try, it will never go right. So what should I do if the problems I face won't come up from this deep, dark place inside of me? Who should I turn to if I can't even turn to the person who gave life to me? Who can I turn to? The answer is we equipped our teachers with trauma-informed training. We equipped our teachers to know that we are centers for healing engagement. You call them schools, but they're really centers for healing engagement. And so we see the basic needs first. We see the life needs first. We say we are your life coach. Call us at any time because we are the one that you can turn to. We are local parentes by definition, which means in place of parent. That's the role of every teacher. That's the role of the teachers who really teach well. They see the person. I see you means inclusion. It means being, sensing what's needed. That's the S. It means engaging them and empowering students. It means empathy. So like you got to care it from some experience base. But if you haven't experienced it, it's okay. Then get the you part, understanding. I see you, understand, have empathy, engage, empower, sense it and see it, and then include whoever you need. Because granted, teachers shouldn't do everything. That's why I have two therapists in every school for the students, and I have a therapist for the staff because they're secondary recipients of trauma. We have parent-child interaction therapy. Look it up. We're the only in the state of Missouri, and we're one of three in the nation who actually has parent-child interaction therapy and teacher-child interaction therapy, where you teach teachers to interact with students who have therapeutic needs. And it, the issue is relationship. If your student loves you, they're going to tell you more than they will tell some stranger or someone that where a therapist has to take six months to build relationship. But you saw them when they came and they were hungry and they just got abused and they needed someone. You were there. They love you. So love them back. Maslow's before Bloom. That's what we do. That's what we've done. So in addition to those things we've done, we then make sure that we do our teachers, send them on externships. We pay our teachers to go to learn in other spaces on how people do it in business. So they'll go to a hospital and see and learn. They'll go to a scientist's office. They'll go on externships to corporations so they can see in real time ways that are going to solve solutions or provide solutions to, to, to sever that gap that we may have. Then we pay all of our students too internships because a lot of times our students are able and capable and when you can give them the way and the path and let them write their plan then they can do it so our students get paid as much as 20 to 20 dollars an hour at 17 years of age to work at cvs snooks mcdonald's and other places that's known across the nation as a part of our career pathways the bottom line is we're meeting those basic needs we have two homeless shelters that our students built because kids were homeless and we own and operate. We have two health-based clinics within our system that are that give 100% free healthcare to all students, even minor surgeries, even COVID, uh, COVID tests and immunizations and the, the works. And then we also have two grocery store hubs that we built, own and operate to give free groceries to anyone in need, just walk up and get it. That's putting our money where our mouth is, putting those basic needs first, Maslow's before Bloom's taxonomy.
Thanks, Dr. McCoy. I think I'm gonna come back to you. I'm gonna see how, how, how the skeptics in the chat are receiving it. We might come back. I wanna go over to Jasmine okay. for a minute. Um, so Jasmine, I would love for you to pick up on some of what we just heard. Um, Cause there was also a question in the chat about when you take the police out of schools, what do you do instead, right? Um, and so I would love to hear you talk a little bit about um, identity affirming education, as well as some of the other proposals that you all have, because you all have something pending um, with Stockton City Council around this and around removing police from schools and what to replace it with. So tell the people, what do we replace it with? Yeah, well, I'll just really quickly just wanna go back to just like how we even address safety and how we even look at it, right? Hey, to a part of Dr. Art's point is like the strongest communities and the safest community, the strongest communities are oftentimes the most safest safest communities right and that when we start thinking about what safety means we oftentimes should be looking at it on what well-being means for our young people and when you center well-being as a community then you can be able to center the conversation around safety and one of the things that we've been doing in Stockton and specifically around Stockton Unified is getting teachers educators and systems to re-look at safety as a public health from a public health stance and when you begin to center that as a well-being, we realized that we were able to chair, change this conversation around shared safety. And California's for Safety and Justice has a lot of research and work on what shared safety means. Um, and when you look at that, you will understand that actually well-being means that people can can live in conditions that are that promote mental health that promote physical health that are connected to resilience and connected to sort of dignity and these resources for young people and every person to really reach its highest potential to thrive and oftentimes i think what even art he may not realize is like i'm like that's actually abolitionist teaching what you are doing right and by doing that you actually are articulating how communities and people should show up for young people. And I think what we've been pushing in Stockton is for us to really take a look at, again, what is well-being for a young person? What are young people in our communities are waking up to violence, waking up to, 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 to poverty, waking up to conditions around them that, that we literally clearly ignore. And one of the things we've been telling our teachers and communities it's like you can't just want educational justice from 8 to 3 30 because young people go home after that young people are showing up even before that and so what it really means for us to radically change the conditions and things that young people are going is is that we must know as organizers educators administrators principals teachers whoever is that educational justice does not stop from the time they enter your classroom to the time they leave your classroom um, and so I'll just get into the framework of what we're doing right now. Um, in Stockton, you know, like many school districts across this country, we saw this rise of young people and communities saying that no more, right? That, that why can our schools be like other communities that don't have law enforcement agencies that don't have these same conditions and the reality is is that when you go to maybe more affluent neighborhoods you see less of policing you see more resources you see more access to things and one of the things that we're doing in stockton was to we put forth a resolution really calling for the district to really reshift safety as a public health issue in stockton we were Stockton Unified is one of 21 school districts across California that actually has a police department uh, using uh, public education funds that pays for the police department. There's over a thousand school districts in California and yet Stockton Unified is the one of 21 school districts. We also are one of 21. We are we were in 2016 where we had the highest arrest rates uh, per capita compared to Los Angeles, compared to Oakland and San Francisco with the highest arrest rates, giving young people the under the age of 10 felonies. And when we start thinking about how we've sort of promoted safety in schools, we actually criminalized and, pun and, and created a, a punitive system. And so what we put forth was we've been making slow trends over the years. You know, we didn't just wake up this year and say, hey, we want police free schools. We've been working for this tour for years and actually organizers for decades beyond this have been calling for this radical change and divestment from 
police and schools. We've seen that in Stockton, we brought forth programs like ethnic studies, where we're now teaching uh, youth in California and students in high school, specifically in Stockton, their culture, their history, where they come from. Because when you know self, you know your history. Um, and we knew that when young people felt more directly connected to themselves, to their histories, to their culture, that they were showing up more in schools, that they were showing up more present in their communities, that they were actually organizing and wanting to actually take action. Uh, we also then started creating, you know, more access to restorative justice we uh, programs, but we also know that that gets deflated amongst conversations. And sometimes people try to, uh, we've seen our law enforcement department now try to uh, take control of the narrative and say, well, you know what, we're going to rename our police department to, to the Stockton Unified Public Safety Department, uh, and we're going to have restorative justice programs and holistic approaches. But the reality is, is no, that's not what the community is calling for. We're calling for direct resources back into our communities. We've been putting forth housing resolutions to provide more housing to affordable housing for our communities and neighborhoods. We're short about 20,000 housing units uh, for families in Stockton, um, particularly that serve our students. That's a lot of housing that is unleft. And I, I don't want to keep, I'm going to keep going on and on. So I'll just try to pull this together real quick, is that we understand that in Stockton, that again, like I said, one of the most important investments we can make is investments in our students. And by doing that is having folks come together and put forth resolutions. I'll share a resolution that we try to put forth. We're still in the process of, of sort of, you know, getting it, it, it pushed through, but it, it calls for some of the alternatives that we talked to, that we were sort of pushing. We know that there is, and we know that there's tons of data out there that, that speaks to, um, you know, uh, that children and adolescents learn best when they're surrounded by people who care for them in a culturally re relevant setting. So a lot of it is around teachings of belonging, teachings of engagement and agency. And through that, there's programs that we have, you know, seen that have worked that, we're, that we'll begin to implement in schools. Um, and then, you know, additional counselors, additional mental health clinicians. We had taken a look at a lot of the data that we've seen like, and I'll, I'll be happy to share folks, like we have like literally data right now that shows sort of policing in the pandemic and what that looks like. I'll just give you a quick overview of what that looks like in Stockton. From the months of uh, July to current right now, law enforcement agencies in Stockton have been, refer have been being, were called to students home for welfare checks. So we are sending law enforcement agencies in Stockton right now, and I can show the data. Um, and this data comes because we had finally had gotten a settlement from Stockton Unified um, through the DOJ and through Attorney General. Um, at the time it was Kamala Harris, but now Javier Becerra who filed a settlement that was over policing and over, disc over discriminating against black and brown students, over policing and over citing them is what the resolution, was what the settlement called for. Um, and that it was found that Stockton Unified was doing that. Um, in the data, it shows that uh, the, in the calls, we were sending law enforcement agencies to re respond to students who were truant, students who were not attending Zoom calls. And then we were also sending students for mental health crisis issues. There were several students who uh, teachers had made a complaint around or, or, or filed um, a welfare check because students showed signs of suicide uh, uh, needs instead of sending mental health clinicians or our counselors, which we have on staff, we still decided to send law enforcement agencies. And this is what is happening across really the country, across the country and in cities like Stockton where we still continue to criminalize mental health. We still continue to criminalize issues that other folks are, are best experts in. And all we're saying is that we should be responding and reinvesting in and those experts who can actually address these calls and services. Um, so those are some of the things that we're working on right now um, to sort of address. And I'm happy to just drop more information in the chat about, uh, about the links that I'm specifically talking about. Thanks so much, Jasmine. And don't worry about going on because you're out here preaching right now. The people are feeling it. So um, I'm starting to get the picture of what a safe school looks like. It's meeting basic needs. It's affirming students' identity and culture and history. Um, 
Miaya, what else would you add? What more does a safe school look like? I would say a safe school looks um, more like making sure that we are focusing a lot on the mental health of young people um, and not on the criminalization of young people. Um, I think that too often we focus on what the young people did at the time and not why they did what they did. Um, and, and, and just making sure that we are um, investing in our young people when it comes to uh, their mental health, putting more counselors inside of the schools and, and stop over policing our schools, making sure that we have peace programs and these restorative justice practices programs that can help a young person uh, that can target the root causes of problems because ever so often, like I said, we, we think about the things that young people do and we don't think about why they did it. What is going on in this young person's home to make them want to do these things that they're doing? And how can we make sure that we revert from the, the police officers that we're putting in our schools? How can we make sure the counselors are, you know, trained, or not counselors are trained, but how can we make sure the staff are trained to handle these types of situations that young people face at home in school? And in their communities um, and, and build those relationships. We don't build enough relationships with our young people because how is it that you're in a, a, a school and you don't know a lot of these young people's names and, and you don't know anything about them? Um, it, it's, it's really you know sad that a lot of these staff members don't even know the young person. And a young person could have been going there from their freshman year uh, all the way into their senior year and you don't even know who this young person is. Um, so I think that building those relationships and having those conversations with young people can really change a lot of young people's lives and a lot of young people are reaching out and do need the help but you know no one is talking to them and, and trying to find out you know what can they do to make sure this young person isn't you know facing these um, problems at home and inside of their communities and their schools um, so yeah I would just say you know investing more in our young people's education when it comes to mental health um, and, and get into the root causes of problems and stop over policing our schools because we don't need police we need someone who is basically trained to handle uh, these types of traumatic situations that go on um, in young people's lives. Um, because, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not fair that our young people are, are trying to reach out, but no one's listening and no one's taking the time out to actually understand young people. Like I said before in the last um, panel, uh, I learned from, you know, SROs that these SROs are trained are not, they have the training, but they don't even go to the training. So what you're saying is you're putting a, a police officer inside of our school that they're not mandatorily trained to go inside of this school. That's when we have situations where police officers are choking students and pulling them out of their chairs and locking them up, putting them in handcuffs and all types of things like that that without contacting their parents and, and all of this type of stuff, we could have had avoided these type of issues by getting the counselor in, finding out what's going on in this young person's home to make this young person act this way. If we, we don't start getting to the root causes of problems, we're gonna still keep constantly putting our young people um, up to not succeed and that's not fair. They deserve a fair education and they deserve a fair chance at success and we're not, going to get that if we keep over policing our schools and not trying to get to root causes of problems. Thank you, Miaya. So we got to get to the root causes. We need restorative justice. We need peace programs, but not fake restorative justice, not just calling something else restorative justice is not. We need the real deal. Um, so I'm going to go because I'm going to get a little bit nitty gritty for a minute. Um, and Dr. McCoy, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, to Miaya's point about getting to the place where you are, have the adults in the building sort of committed to building these relationships with young people and sort of that's primary. It wasn't like that when you got to where you are, right? You had to, there was that's a right. journey that that's had right. to be traveled and you had to move people along. And, you know, I think there's a lot, of, folks have a lot of questions. Like, again, you take out the metal detectors, you take out the SROs, like, why doesn't all just go crazy? Like, what are you saying, right? Mm -hmm. So please talk to us a little bit about the journey from where you all started to where you all have gotten to now, what that's looked like and what that has required in the way of resources to, to make that journey successful. 
Great question. Thank you so much. So the journey is you go back in time eight years and it was a place that that some of you have described where white people were leaving this place because they're like, it's not safe anymore. I hear gunshots and where there were thefts and carjackings and so forth. And the school district was provisionally accredited. So it lost its accreditation. And immediately, again, you needed people who could come in that had power inside to help people either grow or go, unfortunately. And so that that's the role of the CEO and that's the role of administrators and that's the role of any person with power, teacher, a parent, and students have power. So if the school, so for instance, if a parent was negligent to a child and didn't feed them, didn't give them a house, didn't give them clothes, give them, then the state comes and take them away. Well, if the school system is negligent, the school should be taken away from those people in power who are negligent. And so ultimately a new team came in. I'm a part of that new team that's not negligent. And we said, all right, you have to have this moral core in your heart that it's about students first. And if you're about your power, your job, your gun, you can arrest, you can do this, then you need to go because we don't even need to grow you. You don't have the heart. It's a heart condition, then a head condition, and then a hand condition. So if your heart is right, then you can say something because I don't care what you know until I know you care. And then once I know you care, now I'm gonna listen to you. And then you can take me by the hand and help lead me. So we essentially had to have new teachers, new principals, new, new leaders, new partners to come in. And then those that remain had the heart to do whatever it takes to help the students and put the children first. And so that was the journey. And ultimately then it led to teachers saying, yeah, we're about Bloom, we're about Maslow's before Bloom's. Bloom's is second or third or fourth. We want to see if you, if you are loved, if you belong, if you have esteem, if you have safety and so forth. And that that's the culture we had to create. Some people always wanted it, but didn't have the leadership to say, hey, you have permission to do this first. Some people, they're in school and they feel like they have to do, they have to teach what the book says. They have to, they can't have the student determine what the content will be. Well, kids come with knowledge and the kids know something before they get there. And if you care about what they know, you'll put what they know first and then build on what they know. And so by having leadership change that paradigm, then you can get closer to a school being a center for healing engagement. And so what that means is if there is any beef, you you are here to solve it. If there's anybody walking down the street with a gun to come to school because it's not safe to walk in the neighborhood, then you go out to the neighborhood and walk with them so they don't need a gun. You get hands-on engaged. You make sure that you meet the need at the speed of the need from outside the school into the school. And so that does take people power. That takes knowledge of yourself. Uh, Jasmine said it right. This is, this is re I'm an educational reconstructivist. And when I gave a workshop in the heart of the South Alabama saying I'm an educational reconstructivist, they were too happy because they remember the social reconstructors, reconstruction. Well, it's really tied to that. What is the purpose of school? It's to be used to better society. So if students have killings outside their school, then they need to study killings. They need to say, we don't like killings. They need to be empowered by the money and the people to then stop killings. And if that means more after school programs, then spend all of it on that. If that means you don't have enough money, then tell those big companies, give you their corporate responsibility money, which is how we got $20 million of private money to make it happen. And so once you started getting results, of not one suspension of any K through six kid, not one being suspended, not one being arrested, because the principals won't suspend you. They're gonna say, why did you have this blowout? Why did you curse this person out? And now let's talk about this. What is the therapy, the trauma, the trauma-informed response? Then you start to see graduation rates. When you tell third graders that if you are proficient in literacy, you are a jail cell closer. So now go read a book because somebody died just to read a dictionary. Malcolm X read a dictionary in jail. Slaves died when they opened up the primer, which was basically a dictionary. So now you close a jail by show of hands in the school. Who all has a family member that's in jail? All lot, hands go up everywhere. Now by show of hands, how many of you want to close a jail cell? Okay, be proficient in reading by third grade because third grade jail cells, uh, or third grade test scores predict how many jail cells to build in three or four states and then fourth grade in other states. And it's accurate. Look it up, it's the ACLU report. But that is teaching through a social reconstruct, an educational reconstructivist lens, which is based off of people like Booker T. Washington and others and Frederick Douglass, who, who said, this is literacy for liberty. 
literacy for liberty. That, that's th their words. I studied them and I tried to duplicate them. But the journey is educating educators that this is the purpose of education. This is why you're here, to empower these people that you have charge over and to love every person that you have Love, have any charge over. You can't lead your people unless you love your people. You can't save anybody unless you serve everybody. That's what we do. And there's a follow up from the audience, which um, is related to something we talked about a little bit on the last one um, around unions mm, yeah. um, and just sort of yeah. general resistance to, change, to <laughs> these types of changes that you're talking about. Um, mm. What were your strategies? Yeah, that's real. That's real. Yeah, you have to lead and not be afraid of the union. My first speech to the union was, okay, so I, I became an educator in high school too. Let me just start there to say who I'm like at 15, 16, uh, we had issues and I was a student saying, we need to flex this voice because you adults are not getting it. And you all are fake, you're busters, you're a joke. Let me educate you. And so now then becoming an 18 year old certified teacher, 19 year old mathematics high school teacher, I was older than some of the kids I taught, youngest in the state of Missouri. So that's my story. So I'm a, I'm a 25 year education veteran with just 40 years, 42 years of life. I can retire in four months. And I just turned 42 because I started as a kid. And I'm still a kid. And so now, so now to the question. Uh, all right, so now to the question. You know, you you have to, you have to, let me just keep on that note. You have to lift up the student, any adult in this environment that puts themselves above the voice of the children. That that's that's the piece. So the union often is there to preserve themselves, self-preservation, ease of job, making sure things are comfortable for them. You, if you root out teachers that are there for themselves and keep mostly teachers that are there for the students, and our mantra is students first, then even the union begins to do what you need them to do because you rooted out the poison. There is a poison when somebody feels that even the entity of teachers should be placed above the students. And so by virtue of my school being in session during COVID, when you can literally die, my one another of my soul songs was educate as if your life le uh, legacy and liberty depends on it because it does educate as if your life your legacy and liberty depends on it because it does then you see biden and trump and your liberty's gone if you don't do that right oh that makes sense educate so this isn't happening to us okay what about liberty covid happens and what did we see we saw millions of people hiding in their house rightfully so to not get covid and so they would limit their liberty to lengthen their life. And then George Floyd dies. And then you saw millions of people say, I'm willing to lose my life to lengthen our liberty. And so for the union, you ask, which side are you on? Are you on the Hyde side or are you on the liberty expansion side? And so my system is open and my people are risking their life to educate kids in person because they're on the liberty side. And so even if you approach the union that way, then the union will say, okay, we put our lives on the line for this. Make sure you pay us right. And you better believe I'm the fifth highest paying district in all the county because we, we love them with the money and we love them with listening to them to say, if you're for kids, then I can listen to you and give you more power to do more for kids. And so when you align that, mor that moral code all together, then the union gets in line with that. And that's why so many schools will have trouble just opening up. And I have to just say, just the, just because I'm on the COVID task force for my whole state and, and beyond, it's gonna be about two years of dealing with this situation of what to do in light of COVID. So you're seeing a test of character. And so people have to attack it. I'm gonna be frank, many superintendents, many administrators are not strong enough to tackle that head on. So that's why you need this very important point. Listen to me carefully. When you have so many millions of feet on the streets protesting, don't settle for small change. <laughs> you got to demand big bills and big action because the millions of feet on the streets say the people deserve this. So now you, if you're a teacher and there's a union that doesn't even like what you do, because that happens, that hating internally, teacher on teacher, because you want to be there after school, but the union says go home at three o'clock. Those feet on the street are saying, there's no more time for small change. And Barack Obama ran on, it's time for change, whom I, I loved and did some work under his administration. But now, no, with millions of feet on the street, bigger than the civil rights movement in the 60s, no more small change, big bills. Because if these kids don't show up, 
then there is no job. And that's why I say to my kids, don't show up if you don't feel safe and don't show up if it ain't worth showing up to. So the schools that have trouble getting kids into school during COVID are the schools that are a joke, that don't have anything for them when they show up anyway, didn't see them, don't know their name. But the schools where they're showing up during the midst of COVID is where they co they're coming to get some love. That's why some of us have some kids that are showing up and their death and their life is dependent upon it. They feel like they have pandemics in the middle of an epidemic where there's already two, uh, every two hours a black male aspires from an act of homicide. And that was happening way before COVID and no one really shouted that to the rooftops. And so like, okay, yeah, I'm gonna go to where we're not gonna get shot. I'm gonna go to make sure my community isn't one of those communities. We haven't had a shooting of a kid, thank goodness. And we're gonna continue to make sure that that happens uh, in my five years. Uh, and that's a blessing. So we just, we gotta stay on it. It's a process. You gotta bring the union on board. You gotta, if you can't change people, change people. That means that if you can't change the union's mind and sometimes you need to change some of the staff members and they need to go somewhere else. You need to help them out, you know, help them somewhere else. They may need another district. They may need another job. It may be time. They may need another position. They may need to become administrator, but help them out. And so that's what you got to do. That's what leadership looks like and sounds like and is like. That was the hashtag I was looking for. If you can't change people, Change, Change people. people. That's right. <laughs> um, Jasmine, you were nodding along a little bit when we were talking about um, the unions and the powers that be that sort of a fight and change. Can you share a little bit of your experience with that? Uh, where do I start? <laughs> let me. I, I I think Lewis mentioned it in the in the chat. Um, let me go back to it. Yeah, that 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 it's they're co-opting a move a movement strategy to keep further the existence of policing. And we've seen that, you know, in Stockton this year, when we had put forth our, our resolution, um, our police union has never been active, quite frankly, they've never been face fronting. And until we brought that up, it was like, whoo, all, all game was on, you know, we saw that we realized that, you know, there was now unions being activated, um, getting our teachers to, to say, hey, no, you can't support this resolution because we're a part of your contract. We started seeing that contracts and negotiations that were happening really off the record weren't being transparent to the community. And once we recently submitted a public records request on all contracts that have to deal with, you know, Stock Unified Police Department, we realized that literally every contract had some form of um, law enforcement involved for protection, for safety, as sort of their safeguard um in, in, into what was happening i think some of the, the biggest things we've seen sort of with unions is that um there's a lot of protection around what happens there's a lot of you know closed door conversations there's a lot of behind closed meetings um you know negotiations that are happening often with union leaders and as as a community organizer and community leaders it's oftentimes very hard to even know who are your president needs you know how do we get access to them you know there's no real you know tracking of like like literally it's a hunt and it makes it so extremely hard for communities to even weigh in on processes. And we talk about wanting to have transparency in schools and communities, yet one of the biggest things that makes these, these contracts and negotiations oftentimes are unions. I would just say that, um, you know, it's been extremely challenging and that there's a lot of sort of, you know, when we talk about sort of the roop like, um, issues that we talk about it's like that is a part of it you know and and i think we just got to call it out i think the the root of the issues in schools have to oftentimes do with white supremacy have to do with racism have to do with um, oppressing our young people from actually having access to it why are we still to this day fighting over whether or not a child should have a book or whether or not like things that students deserve are still a fight Right. And no one has no one pushes back against the narrative around um, no one got mad when we de when education continues to be the most defunded department in this country. No one ever pushes that back against that. And then, it, it, you know, when we start thinking again about what is violence, I think Julian Bond says it's the best that violence is black children going to school for 12 years and receiving six years worth of education. That is violence. And when we talk about 
what is violence in schools and what is safety, it is actually schools doing that, is, is literally taking away civil rights, human rights that young people need. And when we think about um, what school and education looks like to me, I think that that's what, like that to me, that is the issue when we talk about the root issues of what is happening. And we can get, when we can just get to that, I think we can move forward. Um, but you know, progress comes at a price and change is hard. And we also need money to invest in this work. Um, and I think that if we really want to, to move forward as this country, there's going to be some hard cuts that need to happen. And it's, and it's coming um, out of places that are the most funded departments in this country. And when we wanna talk about equity and we wanna talk about all these things, we must understand that we must take a look at what, act, what young people actually need. And when we get to the root of it, we know it's not what is currently in front of us right now. Um, and so, yeah, I just say that for, it is tough. We're still trying to navigate how unions are working in schools. Um, you know, we're trying to, one of the things we just recently did is uh, we're, we're advocating for there to always be a representation, a representative from a student base, parent base, to be a part of every contract negotiation for every single department in the education system. That's new, that is, we're getting closer to having that amended amongst all union contracts in Stock Unified. We put forth some, um, some resolutions and puts forth some new policies to amend how, how contracts and negotiations, negotiations are happening. Um, and so we're still in the battle of just legal stuff going back and forth, but like that's what it should take as well is that we must be at the table when these conversations are being had about, about these different contracts. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with 100% of what uh, Dr. Art was talking about, it's, it, it's necessary. And, and I just, I appreciate Jasmine's comments because you, you're right on. I, I just saw the question in the chat and they used one key word that I, I want to make sure we hit hard and that is what strategies. So that means that somebody's in the midst and they're dealing with this problem right now. So let me just mention two or three and I'm going to get off this so you can get to the next uh, issue. One strategy is unions have a rep, a, a, a job to represent their uh, issues. So they want, they want equal uh, pay they want, or they want good pay. They want representation for whoever they represent. So females in jobs, um, more in leadership, more voice and so forth. So the issue is if you have a problem and you see that they have a problem, that's the same problem you have, for instance, like you want better service for the kids that you serve and they're Latino and black kids and your teachers are 70% white, then use the union to say, you're about representation, right? And you're about uh, uh, quality and fairness of pay and representation more. So let me help you build your diversity within your union. That's a secret strategy. And then once the union puts diverse people in leadership roles that can have empathy to the issues of the kids they serve, then they cannot sit there and go back home to their Latinx home or African-American home and say, I just screwed these kids. I just screwed this community. They, they will know it because they were one of those kids. Unlike some of the more privileged people that can be white or black or, or other, but if you haven't lived it, then empathy is a little harder. So use that equity thing within their the union to ultimately put more enlightened people in leadership positions of the union and to support them and push them when you see the right one. That's one key strategy I've done over and over and over again to make the union president in the school buildings and in the district level, someone who has true empathy towards the social justice cause. Then you got common ground when it's time to come to negotiations. So that's rule number one. Rule number two is the golden handcuffs. If you pay them enough to make it hurt for them to leave, then they'll do what you want because they want the golden handcuffs. <laughs> so that, that's just two strategies. I'm gonna stop it at that. <laughs> All right, and we're going to take it to another topic because, again, we got the people with the what ifs, and I want to answer the what ifs for the people. Um, so, there was a question um, around, you know, we're talking about safety in the school building, and uh, a lot of the perceived threat is from outside the school building. You know, folks are worried about someone coming in to do something in the school. Um, and I'm going to, what I'm hearing from you all, is that that line in school, out of school, 
is not no. as um, clear and strong as people seem to want to think it is or like to think it is. Um, and that who a school is in a community tells you something about who's going to come in and do what, or who's going to do what nearby. I'm going to toss this to anybody who wants to take it. Um, you know, again, how do you make a school safe in the context of a larger community that it's in? Whoever wants to take this can jump in. Lady, ladies first, if unless you wish to defer. <laughs> Uh, it looks like it's all so, you, Dr. McCoy. <laughs> okay, so, all right. So just to make sure I got it, how do you make uh, the whole community safe? Not just the school, the inside and the outside, right? Yes, because so that it's not, you know, you're not worried about people coming into your school. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, that's real. Uh, that's very real. Okay, so number one, you need, I, I'm going to lean back to my ancestors, the beloved community. Martin Luther King, you know, often referred to the community of people who marched with them as the beloved community. And so you really have to establish the beloved community. How do you do that? You got to have people who are willing to sacrifice their lives for the community. So that's people inside the school as teachers and administrators, but that's also parents and that's the students and that's others. And when black kids couldn't even go to white schools, he had the strategy to have black kids march and other white kids who were on that side who would be bullied and hazed to march. So, so when Chicago had teachers and, and parents marching down the same streets that had 37 killings in one, in one school semester before even April, when they were out there marching and when there were efforts like We Schools where the students did a campaign on it, which we're a big part of and started it in Missouri, the killings really did stop while there were feet on the street walking to school with the kids and from home with the kids because the beloved community said you got to kill all of us and then we see you and we know where you live and somebody gonna die and it's gonna be the ones calling and killing because we're gonna we're gonna do the old testament <laughs> and so and so that that's the beloved community where you literally have to have some adults that are the biggest and the baddest people on their block and they're the crazy enough to confront crazy because you're just a little bit crazier because you know that if you don't, then it's going to it's going to rule. And, and we don't want just the, the daytime. We want the daytime and the nighttime, too. That means that it's not good enough if there's no killings at daytime. We want the bullets to stop going at night, too. So so it takes the beloved community who will be willing to get shot, hurt and, and, and sometimes bruised for the right cause. And that's good trouble. Uh, that's good trouble. And it starts there. My first day, second day in this office, coming back from California, doing work in San Francisco and in Newport. And I come and I'm not on payroll yet. And I'm outside as the CEO with dismissal of my high school on a big crowded intersection. And I see uh, some people out there standing on the corner. It's like, okay, drugs. And then I see some of them like starting to posture for a fight. And what do I do? I walk up to them. I actually run to them. And I, I'm like, what's up? What you here for? You got something for me? I mean, it's crazy. The cops said, Doc, you're going to get shanked. I mean, they literally said that, quote unquote, meaning I'm going to get stabbed. I said, no, I don't need you. Because if I'm bad enough to go up to the biggest threat, then they're going to say some dude's crazy around here. Who is this crazy dude? And the point is, if you got about 1,000 of them, you got if you got about 10,000 of them, then even the gang elements listen and say, let's do business with you. All right, what's up? What territory is yours and what's ours? Even People will listen to people who love their community enough to put their life in harm's way to do something, as opposed to hiding at the night. And I'm not saying it's wrong to hide because sometimes you're outnumbered, but you need an army, an army of the beloved community for what's right to take back your community. And then you don't need the occupiers, the, the police. They don't have to occupy you and terrorize you because you actually have community policing uh, like it is still in Africa and Kenya and so forth to this very day. Uh, I do happen to wear red because I'm a Maasai warrior too. And I understand that community and that's who I'm from. So even before slavery, I'm unslaved and we need to unslave ourselves in our own communities. And that's why also part of defunding the police means us taking that money and giving kids internships and scholarships and, and jobs and, and apprenticeships with all 3 million and 5 million of these contracts that are there, give it back to them. And they'll start saying, don't mess up my school. Don't mess up my $20 an hour job. Don't mess up these templates that I got because I'm doing this and get my high school diploma. That's what our kids do. So now they champion their own place to say, oh yeah, doc, that cat over there, he has a gun in this book. 
bush and he's trying to say he's going to sell some stuff because and we got him we got him we got him. we don't even need the cops nothing illegal happens yet we just got you we got you so that that's the real deal and that's what happens in good communities that's what happens in places where the adults who are for good actually run their own streets and their communities we just got to take them back as much as we can I appreciate y'all. So we're getting towards the end of our time. I think I hit everything in the chat. If I missed you, I apologize. But I just want to give each of you all a chance to give um, some parting words. And so, Miaya, I'm going to toss it to you first. I want to leave folks with the positive vision. Um, and just, again, one more time for the people in the back. <laughs> what does it look like for us to have safe schools and communities that are free of police? Um, so again, um, I agree with what um, Dr. Art said. Um, you have to think about, um, you know, the basically what I said before, root causes of, of problems. When you think about, well, why is all of this stuff going on in the community and in the school? We have to think about at home. So that means investing in building that relationship with those young people and talking about what's going on in their homes and how can you make it better if there's a lack of food then help out with food if there's a lack of you know a, a lack of them feeling comfortable with their parents then you need to feel build that relationship with that young person um when we think about the communities we need to think about okay so there's gang members why are these gang members feeling like they need to protect their territories why are these gang members feeling like they need to sell these drugs we need to get to those root causes because at the end of the day nine times out of ten the reason that this drug dealer is selling this drug is because he's trying to make make some money for himself and his family he can't get no job he he's been in jail First of all, because he was on the street trying to make money for his family. So no one's really understanding that. So now we have this person, th this young man on the streets selling these drugs. And then he also is carrying a gun because he has to protect himself because there's other threats. No one really fights fair anymore. There's literally guns being pulled out all the time. So we need to figure out how can we stop the guns? How can we stop drug dealers from needing to to feel like they have to sell drugs and carry these guns. So that means going to these drug dealers and being like, hey, like Dr. R said, I have a job for you. I have this job in place for you. Do you think that you would wanna, you know, mentor these young people to get this pay? Like we, we have to start thinking about those things as well because we, want, we, we won't get any of the things that we need unless we start tackling these root causes and thinking about why are these young people so willing to pull the trigger? It has something to do with mental health. Why are these hurt young people hurting other young people? We, we have to start thinking about this. And, and when it comes to our school systems, why does everything that is at the home and in the community is brought back to school? Because we have no one talking to the young people and, and trying to find out what's going on in the homes and in the schools. So once we start targeting the homes and the communities, everything will get so much better for our schools. There will be no more policing because we have people who are trained to handle this. We have the community behind us, like Dr. R said. So once we start doing that, our school systems will be so much better and we can stop thinking about police being shoved into our schools with our black and brown young people because we have targeted the root causes of these problems and we have, you know, got down to the nitty gritty. We, we've talked about these things. So no young people are feeling the need to, okay, my community isn't safe. Well, your community is safe now because we've targeted those issues. So now your school is much safer and we don't have to see these police who aren't trained and these police who are racist in our in our black and brown schools with our young people and, and our children and things like that. So once we start getting to the root causes of problems and focusing on investing more into our young people and in our communities, we, we won't need these over police schools and, and you know these police setting our children up just to feel like they are in prison. Thank you, Miaya. And we had um, a comment in the chat that someone's first and seventh grade boys are feeling you and what you're saying about what we need in our schools is really resonating with some other young people who might be in the background. Um, Dr. Art, I'm going to go to you next for your parting words. You know what, Ms. Coleman just said it up. I mean, you know, there's nothing else to say besides <laughs> amen. And the church said amen. <laughs> you know, so I'm just going to hit the note of basically 
we have to not settle for small change. You need big bills and big actions. So you have to start somewhere. That means be a center for healing engagement. Start from the inside. And then once people trust you and know that you care, then they're going to let you know what they need. And then what does equity look like? It looks like equity is what love is really in public among strangers. So equity looks like love in public among strangers. And what is that? It's meeting the needs at the speed of the need. So you create a feedback loop where you listen and people who care then say, they, I need jobs. You need jobs. Let me get you jobs. I have incarcerated young men right next to me, 20 of them from other school districts who I started a program and enrolled them and gave them jobs as carpenters. And they're now like, thanks, man. I don't have to look behind my shoulder just because of what Ms. Coleman said. It's exactly. And it's like, that's all I needed. That's all I wanted because I'm hungry. And my mom ain't there for me. She's struggling herself. She's got COVID or she's ill or she's got issues. It's like, that's the truth. So just meet the needs at the speed of the need. Be the caring adult that when some kid sees you, you are a home, a center for healing, for healing engagement. Just be it and just ask them, what do you need? Uh, who are you? What do you need? And then you go together to get there. Ask everybody. Don't be ashamed and ask them for a lot of money because the point is we have not because we asked not. I started getting millions because I started asking for millions. And I'm like, okay, if you don't give it to us, then you fake. You said you were cool. You said you were for us. Okay, but you didn't give nothing. All right. This is who you are. Put you on blast. Go to the next one. The bottom line is care enough to, to, to do for those who you care for and you can make anything happen. That's the only way that I know that this district that I oversee for four, five years now is 98% black, 100% free reduced lunch, 100% graduation, 100% of them get a job before they leave, that's that internship, and or college paid for without them paying for it. The only district accredited with distinction that's black in the state of Missouri. So, hey, there is hope. We make it possible. We're not special. We're committed. So be committed. Thank you, Dr. Art. So many more gems in there. I love that. We're not special. We're committed. Um, Jasmine, I'm going to give you the last word. Close us out. What's your parting words for us in terms of what this looks like? Well, thank you to, to both our speakers. I've just learned so much and literally is refused my energy and my soul. So I just want to say thank you. And thank you to everyone in the comments. Um, I mean, like, first of all, like nothing stops a bullet like a job. Like that's just period. So <laughs> give our young people a job, give our young people something that they can invest in. Um, and I'm also oftentimes reminded sort of of this African proverb that says the child who's not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. If we continue to, to show up and not care for our young people and when they feel like our village is not supporting them, all they will do is burn it down. And at this point, we must burn it down if young people, if, our, if we are not getting the resources we need, if we're not getting the type of, um, if, if we want to reimagine what this system is doing, the system is working exactly how it should be because it wasn't created for us. Um, and so I just think that as we continue to reimagine what safety is, I think I mentioned it earlier, it's just like the strongest communities are the safest communities. And that is when we center well-being. That is when we center community first. And when we reshift its focus to focus on safety as really uh, as, as a way for us to center uh, what is necessary and needed in our lives. Um, and I think that when we think of safety um, in schools, like there's, you know, the, the blueprint that I mentioned sort of calls for the five step approach and what it looks like to envision and plan and invest evaluate and strengthen safety in schools. And I think that, um, you know, having restorative practitioners, peacekeepers to serve as, you know, role models are, are a role of maintaining school safety, investing in more in mental health and behavioral health. Um, you know, I think that when we continue to um, not ignore data always and, and what research has said. We know that research proves that policing in schools um, actually does more harm into school, into, for young people in, in communities. Um, and that if we center uh, the five principles of the blueprint and I'll share it in the chat, it, it, it's shifting to a public health framework, well-being and safety. We center crime survivors at the center of those who've been directly impacted. We break the cycle of harm by doing 
doing that. And then ultimately we create policy change by making the systems work, making the systems work towards what we imagine and what we desire them to look like. Um, and when we continue to do that, we build stronger infrastructures for our whole entire community. And it allows local government and, 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 and other groups to recognize and really reckon with the harmful systems that have been in place. Um, and I think that when we can do that, this doesn't just apply to education, it applies to all government, it applies to all groups and, and folks who are overlooking um, our communities. Um, and so by that, I just would say that when we center our people and one of the most important things is that oftentimes we'll see folks co-opt our movement and our our work by saying well the data says this and we get caught up in the data fight we get caught up in what the data tells and what our personal experiences have been but when you want to talk about safety at its core when you ask somebody what does safety mean to you you don't hear law enforcement you hear people say safety to me means that it's my family it's my it's i feel safe when i'm with my mother when i'm with my father or when when I'm with my uh, with when I'm with my friends, I feel safe when um, you know when you're in an environment that cares for you. And when we begin to break down safety in that way, let us have that conversation around what safety now can look like when we talk about all those different things we just mentioned. And when we start to really look at it at its core, we realize that we've done wrong all this time. Um, and so. I, I think that that's what I would leave. Um, I'm also happy to, you know, like everyone, this is a, a process and a learning process. If we can be a, a resource or tool to anyone. Um, I heard <laughs> our brother, Dr. Art mentioned the beloved community and the gathering for justice is really rooted and grounded in, in the principles of key and nonviolence. We know that nonviolence is a way for courageous people. And we know that the beloved community is really the framework for the future that Dr. Keynes talks about. And so what I just want to leave with everyone is that we know that the universe is on the side of justice, that we know that the, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And if we continue to keep our eyes on the prize, we'll all do right. And if everyone continues to show up for our people and center Black, Indigenous, and Brown young lives, we can do much better. Um, and so I just want to appreciate everyone who's been on this call. Um, and, you know, I'm learning so much from each and every one of you. So I just want to say thank you to me and the entire team. And I hope everyone who is still with us will join me in thanking our amazing and powerful panelists. Um, I have a couple of quick shout outs. I want to thank the Community and Just Schools Fund who really helped us as we were conceptualizing this and bringing this all together. Shout out to them and their resources. And then a huge shout out to my colleague and partner, Whitney Bunce, who really, this was her baby. She really was putting this together. Unfortunately, she had a family emergency and at the last minute was not able to lead this, um, but I hope we did her vision justice and definitely want to dedicate this event to Whitney and to her family. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. We'll follow up with recordings, resources, and the chat. And please don't hesitate to reach out to me or anybody on the class team. We're happy to connect you with any of our panelists, with resources, whatever you need, we're here for you. Thank you all and everybody have a great afternoon.